in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesy, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Welcome to the Fourth Angels Message Seminar. We invite you to join us as we dig deep into the mind of God's truth. Our speak for today will be evangelist Jimmy Cocoon. Be blessed. Greetings once again, my beloved brothers and sisters, in the loving name of Jesus. I truly want to thank you so much today, brethren, for taking this time once again to join me as we dig deep into the mind of God's precious truth. Today, as usual, brethren, God has a precious message in store for us. Today we're going to be studying, brethren, the great judgment scene, as revealed in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And, brethren, the judgment, which began in 1844, when that door was opened into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and one like the Son of Man was brought near before him. And those books were opened. Inspiration says, brethren, in the book Great Controversy, page 483, that when judgment began in 1844, it began with those that first lived upon the earth, even with the first man, Adam. And the judgment, brethren, is soon to pass on to the living. And that has to do with us. So brethren, in, in the judgment, you have both the judgment for the dead and the judgment for the living. The judgment for the dead naturally only affects the bookwork because the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5. But the judgment for the living brethren not only affects the bookwork, it also affects the church upon the earth. And it's startling to know, brethren, that inspiration says it only takes one sinner. In Testament volume 3, page 265, inspiration says, One sinner may diffuse darkness that will exclude the light of God from the entire congregation. And on page 270, inspiration says, God's displeasure is upon his people and he will not manifest his power in the midst of them while sins exist among them and are fostered by those in responsible positions. So brethren, take your Bibles with me and turn to Revelation chapter 4. And Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So brethren, what did John see hereafter? In Revelation chapter four and chapter five, he saw the great judgment scene. In verse two, the Bible says, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat upon the throne which was God the Father. Because as we read on in these chapters, the Lamb of God, the only one that was found worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof, he came and took the book from the Father's hand. You see, the amazing thing is, brethren, John, he saw the same judgment scene as Daniel did in chapter seven. The only difference is John saw the judgment as it was in progression, in process. But Daniel saw the judgment as it was being set up. He saw the thrones cast down, the Ancient of Days sit on the throne, and then one like the Son of Man came near before him, and the books were opened, and the judgment began. You see, beloved, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, John saw a door that was opened in heaven. Now, which door did John see here in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 that was opened in heaven? And which door needed to be opened? 
See, what we're really reading here, brethren, is the Day of Atonement. The work of Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So when we go back to the type, brethren, when we look at the sanctuary services, because Psalm 77 and verse 13, the Bible says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 8, the Bible says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all, the most holy place, was not yet made manifest while the earthly tabernacle was yet standing. So brethren, when we go back to the Old Testament sanctuary, on the Day of Atonement, the veil or the door to the most holy place opened and the door to the holy place closed. So what happened on the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary became one open apartment. Because naturally, brethren, the door to the holy shut and the door to the most holy, they opened. The door to the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary opened in heaven. And the sanctuary became one open sanctuary. Because brethren, when the door to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary opened. Obviously the door to the holy had to close. Because the, the, the Shekinah glory, God's glory which was above the mercy seat, just flooded the place. So this door that we are seeing here, brethren, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, was the door into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And that's why, brethren, when you go back to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. What is John talking about, brethren? When he says, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, referring to Christ, and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. John was speaking about the work of the Day of Atonement. The door that opened and the door that Jesus opened and no man could close was the door to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And the door that was shut and no man could open was the door to the holy. And that's why I'm saying, brethren, the sanctuary became just one big open sanctuary. Whereas before the, the veil or the door opened into the most holy place, naturally the door to the holy was opened. And that Shekinah glory could not be visibly seen. But on the Day of Atonement, when the judgment began, the door to the Most Holy was opened. And again, brethren, we see that in verse 2. And immediately John says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Naturally, when the father sat on the throne, this is speaking about the great judgment scene, which, which took place, brethren, in 1844. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And brethren, you know, listen, we, we, are, we are so gifted with the gift of the spirit of prophecy. And that's why, brethren, when we go to the book Early Writings, page 42, inspiration says this door into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary could not be opened until the work of Christ was finished in the holy place. And that's why, brethren, this door that was opened represents the door into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And in 1844, brethren, according to the book Early Writings, page 55, the Father stepped out of his throne into a chariot and he was born into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And then likewise, the Son of God stepped down from his throne into a chariot with 
flaming wheels and again was born into the most holy place. You can read that, brethren, in the book Early Writings, page 55. But the question is, brethren, from which throne did both the Father and the Son move from to go into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? You see, brethren, when we go to the book of Daniel, turn there, brethren, Daniel chapter 7. My dearly beloved, in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, the Bible says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. Interesting. And then in verse 13, it says, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. What we are reading here, brethren, in Daniel chapter seven, verses nine and 13 is exactly what inspiration says in the book, early writings, page 55, when both the father and the son stepped down from their throne and were born in flaming chariots into the most holy place. But the question is, brethren, from which throne did the Father and the Son move from to move into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? You see, brethren, these, this throne here, this sanctuary, in Revelation chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 7, which is the same setup, was not always there from eternity. Oh no, brethren, this sanctuary is referred to as being the sin-laden sanctuary because sins were transferred into this sanctuary after sin entered. And therefore it made it necessary for this sanctuary to be cleansed. This is the sin-laden sanctuary, brethren. Turn with me, brethren, to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 22, turn with me there, brethren, and verse 1, the Bible says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And verse 2 says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. You see, this throne, brethren, which is in the paradise of God, is referred to as being the throne of God and the Lamb. This is God's eternal throne, his everlasting throne which was there from the days of eternity, from where both the Father and the Son rule the sinless universe. But both the throne that was set up in Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel says the thrones were cast down. Daniel saw the thrones as they were being cast down. He saw the sanctuary as it was being set up. And then the Ancient of Days did sit, and then one like the Son of Man, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, came and stood before him. So this, brethren, is the sin-laden sanctuary that needs to be cleansed. And that's why, brethren, we need to understand right now the judgment scene as John saw it in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Have you ever wondered, brethren, why John says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22 that when he looked into the holy city, he saw no temple therein. He saw no sanctuary. Look at it, brethren. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22. The Bible says, and I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Why didn't he see no temple in the holy city? 
You see, brethren, this is the reason why. Because once the sanctuary has been cleansed and the sins of God's people have been blotted out, then this sanctuary that was set up for no other reason than to cleanse sin and sinners will no longer be needed. And that's why the time comes when John looks in to the holy city, the holy Jerusalem, and he saw no, no temple, no sanctuary anymore. Because the work of that sanctuary, the sin-laden sanctuary that was set up, its work and its function would have been finished. When sin would have been blotted out. Brothers and sisters, God is so loving for revealing this message to us. God loves us so much, brethren, with an everlasting love. And brethren, while this sanctuary service is going on, a work of purification upon the earth must go on and must continue. The, the sins of penitent believers must be confessed and repented of so that this sin can be blotted out from this sin-laden sanctuary. So we, we need to understand, brethren, the judgment for the dead and the judgment for the living. You see, the judgment will determine, my dearly beloved, who comes up in the first resurrection and who comes up in the second resurrection. The work of the judgment when the Father and the Son Engage in that great judgment scene. Because remember, brethren, although the Father sits on the throne, in John chapter 5, Jesus said, The Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. We know, brethren, that the council of peace is between them both. We know that in Zechariah chapter 6. And Christ is God's thoughts made audible. And that's why... Jesus is referred to as being the word of God. You see, my dearly beloved, Jesus loves us so much. You see, Jesus never counted heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. Can you believe that, brethren? Christ, in all of his glory, counted not heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. So, brethren, if you look at the pictorial representation, here we see today that we've seen already that the father is the great judge on the throne. But here we see also, brethren, that the lamb, who is none other than Christ, our precious saviour, he goes and takes the book out of the father's hand because, remember, there came a time when John wept because he found no man worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And then one of the elders said to John, weep not, weep not, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So here we see that the Father is the great judge. The Lamb of God is our advocate. He's our defender. Our lawyer, if you will. And then John also sees the 24 elders clothed in white raiment. Now, why were these 24 elders, brethren, clothed in white raiment? And who do the 24 elders represent? That are present in the great judgment scene, participating in the great judgment scene. Now, brethren, clothed in white raiment indicates that they were definitely saints redeemed from the earth. What does the white raiment represent? Look at Revelation chapter 19, my dearly beloved. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8, the Bible says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And then in verse 9 it says, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So brethren, very clear it is that the fine linen, clean and white, 
is the righteousness of the saints. So these 24 elders clothed in fine linen, pure and clean, they must represent saints that were redeemed from the earth. Who could they represent, brethren? Brethren, they could only represent those that were re resurrected with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, from verse 51 on down, when Christ rose from the dead, a multitude of saints, and do you know inspiration says, these were they that were martyred for their faith. They were the, the, the wave sheaf that were hand-picked. And they were those brethren that came up with Jesus at his resurrection and they went out on that Sunday morning and proclaimed a risen saviour. According to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, Jesus led captivity captive. A multitude of saints, he led them to heaven as he was escorted back to heaven. By those precious angels. And according to the book of Psalm chapter 24. When the angels that were waiting to receive Jesus. They, they longed to have him received back into heaven brethren. Those angels that were escorting Jesus. They said lift up your heads all ye gates. And be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. And then those waiting sentinels. The waiting angels said who is the king of glory. And then. The angels that were escorting Jesus said, he is the king of glory. The Lord of hosts is his name. But Jesus, when he was resurrected, brethren, on that Sunday morning, he took that wave sheaf to heaven with him. And as tokens of his triumph over sin and death, he presented them to his father. Because the wave sheaf prefigured fruits to be gathered. And after Jesus presented that wave sheaf to his father, and heard from the father that the sacrifice was accepted. Then Jesus came back down to earth. And according to Acts chapter 1. From verse 1 through to 4. Jesus still remained 40 days on the earth. Gathering the 120. And preparing them for the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1 verse 15. Peter stood up and he said there was about 120 disciples. In the upper room. On the day of Pentecost. And, and according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. The Holy Ghost was poured out. On the 120. And then they went out brethren. And they preached. For the first three and a half years. They tarried in Jerusalem. And they still preached to the Jews. To fulfill the 70 weeks of Daniel. But after Stephen was stoned. The Apostle Paul said. It was expedient. That we first preached to you the Jews. But seeing that you prove yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Lord, we turn to the Gentiles. And then after that, brethren, although 3,000 were converted on the day of Pentecost, then after that, um, although Jews, some Jews were gathered still after Stephen was stoned, probation for the Jewish nation had closed. When Jesus stood up and vindicated his righteous servant, Stephen, Probation for the Jewish nation had closed because 70 weeks were determined upon God's people, the Jewish nation, to make reconciliation for sins and to bring in everlasting righteousness. But after they rejected Christ and after they stoned Stephen, probation for the Jewish nation closed. So brethren, the, the 24 elders represented those that were resurrected with Christ. But if we look also, brethren... We see these four beasts. Who could the four beasts represent? With six wings. Go to Revelation 4, brethren. Let's go back to Revelation 4, my dearly beloved. And let's read from verse 7. The Bible says, And the first beast was like a lion. The second beast, like a calf. The third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and which is 
and which is to come. We've seen, brethren, that the 24 elders clothed in pure white linen represented those redeemed from the earth, those that were resurrected at Christ's resurrection. But what about the four beasts, brethren? You see, my brethren, the Bible says the first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now that's interesting, brethren, because when we go to chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, beginning from verse 8, the Bible says, And when he had taken the book, when Jesus, the Lamb of God, had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Brethren, that's so beautiful. Because the Bible says both the four beasts and the 24 elders. They fall down. Before the throne, before the Lamb. And they say, in verse 9... They sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred, tongue, people and nation. So brethren, not only the 24 elders, but also the four beasts were redeemed out of every kindred, Tongue, people, and nation. The four beasts represent saints in the judgment scene. Because that's what we're reading, brethren, in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. The four beasts also, brethren, were redeemed. That's what the Bible says, brethren. They were redeemed out of where? Every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So, brethren... Let's find out a little bit more about the four beasts. Because the first beast was like a lion. Now when we think about a lion, brethren, we're thinking about a lion because a lion is a king of beasts. Remember, God used the lion to represent the first kingdom. After the flood. Concerning the four beasts of Daniel. God used the lion to represent the first period or the first kingdom after the flood. So likewise, brethren, in the judgment scene, in the judgment that we are studying today, God uses the lion again to represent the first period in the judgment. Remember, brethren, when the judgment began in 1844? Inspiration says judgment began with those that first lived on the earth. With Adam, the first period. So, brethren, what we're seeing here. God uses the, the line to represent the first period in the judgment. And then God go, goes on to represent the second period in the judgment represented by the calf. Now, when we think about a calf, brethren, we're thinking about a sacrificial animal. So it moves from Adam's period to around the period of Moses. When God said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And moving from the sacrificial period, we come down to the third beast, the face of a man. Jesus Christ was called the son of man. So the, the third beast brings us into the third period, moving now into the Christian dispensation. But the fourth beast, the flying eagle, naturally an eagle flies. It represents the last period of the judgment, the period where God's saints and God's people will be sealed, not for resurrection, but for translation. Because naturally, the fourth beast, the eagle, it flies. It represents the church 
that's going to be translated from the earth, from among the living, without tasting death. Isn't that beautiful, brethren? The four beasts representing four groups or four periods in the great judgment scene. Beginning from the first period, the lion, right back from Adam to the calf, the sacrificial period, the face of a man. Christ was called the son of man, bringing us into the Christian dispensation. And the eagle, brethren, you see, the eagle again, brethren, being a, a flying beast, it, rep it represents a church that's going to be translated, fly to heaven as it were, without dying, without, without tasting death. So brethren, the judgment for the dead began with the king of beasts, the lion. The judgment for the living begins with the king of birds, the flying eagle. And that's beautiful, brethren. And why do these four beasts, brethren, have each of them six wings? Do you know, brethren, that we have often referred to wings as being swiftness and speed? But is that really what wings represent, beloved? For example, when you look at the he goat in Daniel chapter 8, that touched not the ground, it flew so swiftly through the air, it touched not the ground, and it smote the ram, and it broke off its two horns. Now, brethren, that is swift. So if wings were a, a symbol of swiftness, surely they would have been on the he goat. But we don't see no wings on the he goat. Furthermore, the bear, the bear, the second beast of Daniel chapter 7, representing the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. They overthrew Babylon so swiftly, while the gates, while Belshazzar was having his drunken feast, and the gates were, were open of the kingdom of Babylon. The Medes and the Persians, they moved in so swiftly, they overthrew the kingdom of Babylon in one night. That was swiftly, brethren. That was swiftness. But yet we don't see no wings on the bear. You see, brethren, wings don't really represent speed. They represent periods. We're studying the judgment today, brethren, right? In which of the seven seals does the judgment fall in? It's period or seal number six. Because when you look at the sixth seal, the sixth seal opens with the great Lisbon earthquake, 1755. And then it takes you down to 1833, when the stars fell from heaven. And then 11 years later, in 1844, the judgment began. And that's why these four beasts representing the defendants, those who are being defended by the Lamb in the judgment which opened in 1844. And that's why these beasts, brethren, have six wings. The six wings takes us to the period of the sixth seal. In the seal, when the judgment began, but it began with those that first lived on the earth, with the lion period, and then it moves to the calf, through the sacrificial period, and then the face of a man, the New Testament period, because Christ was called the Son of Man. And then right through to the, the last period, the flying eagle, representing the judgment of the living period, because once the 144,000, the first fruits of the living, and the great multitude, the second fruits of the living, represented by the two types, Elijah and Enoch. Elijah representing the 144,000, sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel, Revelation 7, 4, and Enoch, representing the great multitude because again when, when you go to the book of Jude Enoch is the seventh from Adam Jude chapter 1 verse 14 why is Jude why does Jude say that Enoch is the seventh from Adam 
The number seven, brethren, represents completeness. Acts of the, Acts of the Apostles 585. But why the seventh from Adam? The number seven representing completeness. It goes to show, brethren, that when the everlasting gospel has been preached. And the great multitude, the second fruits of the living, have been gathered and sealed during the loud cry. That will be the gospel work completed. Because the antitypical Enoch's, the great multitude, are the last group to be sealed from the great harvest field. And that will be the gospel work completed. Oh, brothers and sisters, God has given us truth that truly is amazing. So, brethren, the four beasts represent those who are being defended right now in the judgment scene. We are just about to enter into the flying eagle period. The judgment for the living. God has given us right now, brethren, the message in relation to the judgment for the living. To seal us so that when the judgment for the living begins with the slaughter of Ezekiel 9, God's going to have the people sealed and protected that will escape the judgment for the living that begins in the house of God. And then God will send the sealed servants, the 144,000, the first fruits of the living, during the loud cry to gather in the great multitude. But brethren, in a great judgment scene like this, yes, you need a judge. You need an advocate, a lawyer. You need a defender. You need the 24 elders who are representing the jury. Clothed in white raiment, the 24 el elders represent the jury. The four beasts represent the defendants. Those who are being defended in the great judgment scene. Naturally, the Lamb of God is defending them. He's pleading his blood. But you also need witnesses. Who could the witnesses represent, brethren? Look at Revelation chapter 4. In fact, brethren, let's go to Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 11, the Bible says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. Sevenfold praise to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. But the angels, brethren, are round about the throne. Now, what function do the angels have being round about the throne? What is the work of the angels? Doesn't Paul say in Hebrews chapter 1, are they not all ministering spirits? Sent forth to minister unto those that shall be heirs of salvation. Turn me to the book of Ecclesiastes, brethren. In the book of Ecclesiastes, my dearly beloved, chapter 5 and verse 6. The wise man Solomon, he says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Did you get the point, brethren? Here the Bible says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Why not? Because the, the angels, they do the recording with terrible exactness. So no one can say in the judgment that the angel recorded something wrong. So the angels, brethren, are the witnesses in the great judgment scene. But who's missing? The accuser. But brethren, you see, he cannot be around about the throne because, praise God, he was cast out. Look at Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, my dearly beloved, in verse 7 it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. 
Remember, brethren, after sin entered, Satan still had access to heaven. According to the book of Job, chapter one. There was a great day when all the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Although he was cast out from heaven, he still had access. But when he revealed himself as a murderer at the cross, then the Bible says, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And do you know, brethren, that's exactly what Jesus said in John chapter 12. Look at John chapter 12, my dearly beloved. Verse 31. In the book of John chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Well, when was Christ, what time was Christ speaking about? When Jesus said, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Look at verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me at the cross brethren. And that's why when you go back to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, there was a voice which said in heaven, now is come salvation and strength. And the kingdoms of this world and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast out. Which accused them before our God day and night. When was, when was that voice heard in heaven? Now is come salvation and strength. For the, for the accuser of our brethren is cast out. Which accused us before our God day and night. When did salvation come to the human race, brethren? At the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Satan was cast out, brethren. And that's why the accuser of the brethren cannot be round about the throne right now. But he is he's still accusing us, brethren, day and night. Saying to Jesus, how can you cast me out? How can you be just when... These people that you are claiming to save, look at them. How they misrepresent you. And he, he accuses us day and night, brethren, pointing to our sins in such a terrible way so that Jesus will not be able to have mercy upon us. Our brethren, Jesus says to the devil, get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offence unto me. Yes, they may have sinned. Yes, my children may have sinned. But my blood has washed them and cleansed them. Why? Because they have repented. They have repented. And, and as brands plucked from the burning. My blood has washed them and made them white. You see, my brethren, the, the sealed servants of God in these last days will not be turned back by the dragon's roar. They will not. Once the stamp, the seal, has been placed upon them, their characters will remain pure forever. So, beloved... God has shown us a beautiful truth here today, brethren. The great judgment scene, brethren. And maybe we haven't really seen this prophecy in this light before, brethren. My dearly beloved, listen, for more information on these prophecies and many more prophecies, brethren, in relation to the judgment, please visit our website, brethren. But God right now, brethren, he is preparing a people. He is raising up a people. That will not only be saviors to the church. Because brethren, before we are saviors to the world, we must first be saviors to the church. Even the Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? Because the closing work for the church is the sealing time of the 144,000. Testimonies volume 3, page 266, 267. But after the 144,000, have been sealed and saved. Then they escape the judgment. The judgment for the living. According to Isaiah 66 and verse 19. God says I'm going to set a sign among them. And I'm going to send those that escape the judgment in the house of God. 
If you look at verse 16, brethren, the Bible says, Isaiah 66, verse 16, for by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Right now, God is pleading, brethren. He's pleading his blood and he's pleading his precious truth. Because verse 16 says, for by fire, the Holy Spirit, and by his sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Right now, God is pleading through the Spirit and the truth. But those who reject the pleading, brethren, those who reject the message of the judgment for the living, the time will come. Verse 16 says, the slain of the Lord shall be many. And that's why inspiration says, brethren, in Testament volume 1, page 189, 190, inspiration says, and I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. Oh, that every lukewarm professor could realize the clean work that God is about to make amongst his professed people. Oh, brothers and sisters, many I saw inspiration says were flattering themselves that they were good Christians who have not a single ray of light from Jesus. They know not what it means to be renewed by the grace of God. And then inspiration says, and I saw that the Lord, the Lord Jesus, was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. Oh, that every lukewarm professor could realize the clean work that God is about to make amongst his professed people. And then, brethren, same volume, volume one, page 198. Inspiration says, angels keep a faithful record of every man's work. And that's why they are represented as being the witnesses. Angels keep a faithful record of every man's work. And as judgment passes upon the house of God, the sentence of each is recorded by his name. And the angel is commissioned to spare not the unfaithful servants, but to cut them down at the time of slaughter, the judgment for the living. Brothers and sisters, and that's why when you go to Isaiah 66 and verse 19, God says, I'm going to set a sign among them, a seal among them. God seals the 144,000 at this point, the first fruits. God says, I'm going to set a sign among them. Those that escape the slain of verse 16. I'm going to set a sign among them. I'm going to send those that escape of them to the nations that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And then verse 20 says, these escaped ones who will be sent as missionaries to declare God's glory to those who have not heard, showing that probation is still open for the world. They're going to bring all their brethren out of all nations. Because that's where the great multitude come from. When the everlasting gospel is preached to all nations, God's going to bring an, a great multitude, brethren. When, when the escaped ones go to all the nations... It says that these escaped ones are going to bring all their brethren from all nations to God's holy mountain, Jerusalem. And then it says, as the children of Israel, the 144,000, bring an offering. That, that's their brethren, the second fruits from all the nations. They bring them into a clean vessel. Don't miss that, brethren. Isaiah 66 and verse 20, right down the bottom. They bring... The great multitude, their brethren from all nations, they bring them into a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, showing that the house of the Lord has been purified and cleansed. Brothers and sisters, we are just about now moving into the period of the judgment for the living. And God wants us to be ready. And that's why inspiration says, brethren, in volume five. Testaments to the church. Volume five, page 214, inspiration says. The seal of the living God will never be placed upon the foreheads of the impure, upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never, ever be placed upon the forehead of the world-loving, ambitious man or woman. It will never be placed upon the foreheads of those who are of deceitful hearts. And who have deceit in their mouth. And that's why inspiration says, brethren, all, all inspiration says to God's people right now is to go forward. She says, go forward. Go forward. And that's why, brethren, we must keep on going forward with the truth. Marching on with the truth. 
Keep in pace with the truth. But God will have a people, brethren, that will preach the loud cry. Brethren, what are the 144,000 going to preach during the loud cry? Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. The 144,000, brethren, they're going to preach the Sabbath truth. Because when the mark of the beast is enforced, they're going to preach the Sabbath more fully. As the third angel's message swells into a loud cry, they're going to preach the Sabbath more fully. They're going to preach the state of the dead, the truth in relation to the state of the dead. They're going to preach the true method of baptism, baptism by, by immersion. They're going to preach that God has not only given us the Bible, God has also given us the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. They're going to preach the sanctuary truth. That God's way of saving God's people is through the sanctuary. But brethren, they're, what they're also going to preach is, because brethren, for me, the most, one of the most, if not the most satanic messages that the 144,000 must reach out to, to those in Babylon, that those in Babylon are preaching right now is, the doctrine of eternal torment and fire. Brethren, does not the Bible tell us that the wages of sin is death? Oh yes, Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go to Revelation 20, brethren. In Revelation chapter 20, my dearly beloved, and verse 15, the Bible says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that's clear, brethren. Whosoever was not written or found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now go back to verse 14. The Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the Bible, God is saying, brethren, that the lake of fire is the second death. Does it say it's the second life? Because, brethren, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, brethren, those in Christendom are preaching right now that God is going to punish the rejected of his grace by tormenting them in the lake of fire forever and ever and for eternity and forever. And they're going to be alive in the lake of fire. Is that what the Bible teaches, brethren? The Bible doesn't teach that those that, that will be in the lake of fire are going to be alive for eternity. Does it say that? No. The Bible says those that will be cast into the lake of fire, that's the second death. Not the second life. You see, to, to teach that those that will burn in the lake of fire for eternity, that's to teach that those that will be cast into the lake of fire will have a second life. The only difference is they're burning forever. But the Bible doesn't teach that, brethren. The Bible says that those that will be thrown into the lake of fire will burn the second death. And that's why in Malachi chapter 4, my brethren, Malachi says the time is coming. Go there, brethren. That the wicked are going to be ashes under the soles of our feet. How can you burn forever, my, my brethren? If the time is going to come when all the wicked are going to be ashes under the soles of the righteous feet. Look up verse 1. Malachi 4.1 For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. 
And the day cometh that shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Satan, the root of all evil, and his branches, his followers. The Bible says it's going to leave them neither root nor branch. Look at verse 3. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. Ashes, they're going to be reduced to ashes, brethren. It's like when you throw something into, into fire. You throw a big log or a big piece of wood into the fire, brethren. It's going to burn as long as there is something for the fire to prey upon it. And that's why, brethren, in closing, when you go to Isaiah 66, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, my dearly beloved, turn there, and verse 24, the Bible says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. Brethren, what is a carcass? A carcass is a dead body. And that's why the, the lake of fire is the second death, not a second life to be punished for eternity in the fire. Brethren, that is not a doctrine that proceeds from the, the, the precious Holy Spirit of Christ. Oh, no, brethren. Listen. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men. A carcass is a dead body. That have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die. Doesn't say that they're not going to die. The Bible says, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men. A carcass is a dead body. Their worm shall not die. The Bible says, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh they suffer the vengeance of eternal fire it's just like it's just like in the book of Jude brethren in closing look at the book of Jude in the book of Jude there's only one chapter look at verse 7 even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. See, brethren, are those that burnt in Sodom, are they still burning today? Certainly not. But here the Bible says, those that burnt in Sodom and Gomorrah, they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. But they, they're not alive anymore. They've been consumed. And that's why, my beloved, this doctrine of eternal torment is not of God. And that's why the 144,000 during the loud cry will have to make this plain, brethren. Will have to make this seriously plain. Because to, to be teaching that there is a, a place somewhere down there in the center of the earth or wherever it is where people are already burning is that what the bible teaches brethren go to revelation chapter 20 brethren in, in closing again look at revelation chapter 20 look what the bible says brethren in verse 7 revelation 20 and verse 7 and when the thousand years are expired satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. These individuals whom the Bible says are as the sand of the sea are those that are resurrected in the, in the second resurrection. Compared to those that will come up in the first resurrection, they're like the sand of the sea. But look at verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth because they're going to build great, great implements of war to try and take the holy Jerusalem. 
And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then in verse 14, it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. They will die. This is not, the Bible doesn't say this is the second life. Oh no, brethren. It doesn't say that. It says this is the second death. They're going to die. Every man according to his works done in the body. Some will burn longer than others. Some were many days consuming. But the one that will be burning the longest is Satan. And then his angels. Because Satan is the great originator of sin. So brothers and sisters, God has shown us a lot of truth here today. God loves us with an everlasting love, brethren. Let's prepare not only to be saviors for the church, but also saviors for the world, beloved. When with faces lighted up and with their faces shining with holy consecration, the 144,000 will go out during the loud cry to preach the everlasting gospel with a loud cry. With a loud cry, my brethren. And what's going to make the cry loud, brethren, is two things. First, the first thing, God removes the Achans because one sinner may diffuse darkness that will exclude the light of God from the entire congregation. God removes the Achans because even when you go back to the days of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 7, there was only one Achan, one sinner in the camp, in the church at that time, and Israel could not stand before their enemies. Brethren, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, and that's what we're studying today. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12, the time is coming, brethren, that God, even Christ, is going to manifest that his fan is in his hand and he's going to thoroughly cleanse his floor, the church. Oh, my dearly beloved, and God's going to have a church that will enter upon her final conflict during the loud cry. Even the church purified the 144,000, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, the church triumphant will go out, brethren, and say, come out of all my people. Well, what a time that will be, brethren. To save a great multitude, which no man can number. From every kindred, tongue, people and nation. But first, brethren, we must escape the judgment that begins with us. The judgment in the church. First Peter chapter four and verse 17. Peter says the time is coming when judgment must first begin in the house of God, even with the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because when you go to Ezekiel 9 and verse 7, the Bible says, begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men that were before the house. Brothers and sisters, God loves us. God loves you so much, brethren. I hope that this message today that you have heard will be a source of encouragement and revelation to you, brethren. And if you have any more questions, beloved, concerning this presentation today, just visit our website. And we'll be more than glad and happy, brethren, to give you more information. Brethren, until we meet again, may God bless you and keep you. May God cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up the countenance of his love and grace upon you and your family until we meet again. May God bless you in Jesus' precious and glorious name. Amen and amen. Praise God, amen. We trust that your hearts have been stirred by the ever unfolding revelations of God's prophetic word. There are also many more prophetic studies available to you. For further information, please contact us on 1 800 729 7494 or visit us on the World Wide Web 
at www.freeangelsherald.org. Thank you.